Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the People's Maps Commission virtual hearing for the 8th Congressional District. The hearing will now begin. Before we begin, we're just going to touch on a few housekeeping items. This evening's hearing will include introductions of the Commission members, as well as subject matter expert presentations from Ruth Greenwood, Co-Director of Voting Rights and Redistricting at the Campaign Legal Center, Karen Nelson, Equity and Diversity Coordinator for the Appleton Mayor's Office, and former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder, who is the chair of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. Following the presentations, commission members will have an opportunity to have a short period of question and answer with some of the presenters. Finally, beginning at approximately 7.30 p.m., the public testimony portion of the meeting will begin. As a reminder, due to the unfortunate and increasing spread of COVID-19, this is a virtual hearing with many participants from around the state and nation, and technology can be fickle even under the best of circumstances. We appreciate in advance the patience and understanding of the viewers, as well as presenters and commission members, should there be any technical cha challenges this evening. With that, we will now hand it over to Commission Chair Christopher Ford to call the hearing to order. Good evening. I would like to call the first hearing of the People's Maps Commission to order. Uh, as a reminder, uh, we, we do not need a quorum during this meeting as we won't be voting on any matters. Uh, this will be an informational hearing only. Um, when I say your name, commissioners, if you will, please uh, say present. Uh, Commissioner Tobias from the 1st Congressional District. Present. Commissioner Anthony from the 2nd Congressional District. Present. Um, Commissioner McClellan from the 3rd Congressional District. Present. Commissioner Rangal from the 4th Congressional District. Present. Present. Commissioner Ram from the 5th Congressional District. Present. Commissioner Prentice from the 6th Congressional District. Present. Okay. Commissioner Bissonnette from the 7th Congressional District. Present. Okay. Commissioner Phillips from the 8th Congressional District. Present. All right. Thanks, guys. So welcome, everyone, tonight. Um, I wanted to uh, start out by welcoming everyone here. Uh, and sharing uh, some remarks that I prepared before we came here just to kind of answer some questions uh, from the people of the state of Wisconsin, uh, as well as to kind of give you a little bit more depth about who we are as a commission. Uh, following that, some of the commissioners will give you some, um, uh, some of their personal uh, information and how uh, they came to the commission and what their commission represents and who they are. So, um, so before we bring our first hearing, I wanted to share some thoughts with you uh, about the commission itself. Uh, as well as address some concerns expressed by some Wisconsinites thus far. Uh, to begin with, despite each of our leadership experiences, and we come from a, a host of different uh, experiences, uh, full disclosure, it's of no secret uh, that we all are very novice to government undertakings, and furthermore, uh, to the process of redistricting. Now, some people will say that's a benefit, considering that since 1848, uh, government officials and legislators have, have uh, been in charge of drawing maps of Wisconsin. And as we all know, uh, the maps created since that time have not been perfect, and nor have they been fair in the least to all Wisconsin citizens. The electorate should be able to, be, uh, to choose those elected and not vice versa. Secondly, we wanted to express that although our commission was made possible by an executive order by the current governor, we must stress this is not the governor's commission. This is not a commission of the Democrats, and this is not a commission of the Republicans. This is your commission. We are all chosen by a panel of Wisconsin judges, and we come from many different walks of life and have representatives from both sides of the political fence, and some that kind of ride right in the middle. Our goal is not to get bogged down in politics, and our goal is not to infight, not to address this important task with a party lines approach. That's business as usual, and that's not here. Again, we are not politicians. Rather, we hope to create a map free of partisan bias and advantage, a map that prevents the voter disenfranchisement that we've seen thus far. This is what the state deserves, and this is what you deserve. We are indeed a map uh, commission made up of citizens just like you. Personally, I can attest to my own experience growing up in a working class household. My mother uh, is a school teacher still, and my father a fire fire. Um, uh, my brother's a United States Marine. Growing up, my parents impressed upon my brother and I the importance of education and the importance of duty to our family and to our community. 
My grandparents and uncles uh, spoke of our civic, important civic responsibilities, both locally and nationally, as voting was not a right afforded to many of their own generations, uh, and frankly, others of their generation and those before them in other states. I am here because of them. And I and my fellow commissioners are here for you, Wisconsin. My story is not unique amongst those on this commission, and we're all in this fight together. I assure you, Wisconsinites, that we will all be represented and will all be considered. Finally, we fully understand the cynicism associated with a commission like ours of the people being undertook and with such a prized political tool such as the districting maps. Already we've read commentary about how whatever we come up with in this undertaking will be met with objection as those in power wish to uphold their state constitutional right in order to create a map of the state. However, the map we create here in this commission will be based on the census data that is collected this year. We will not look to split up wards or municipalities based on party, race, or any other identifier. We aim to retain the core population from each district. Our map will be compact and contiguous, and more so allow your voice to be heard. If creating such a map based on these core principles is seen as controversial by some in the legislature, not all, I think we as citizens must ask ourselves of this great state, do those who are in power who have those objections really have our best intentions in mind? When they suggest that we cannot end gerrymandering in this commission, what they are really saying is that you, Wisconsin, cannot end gerrymandering. And we, the commission, do not believe that to be true. One person, one vote. So I thank you for listening to those remarks. And before we get go from here uh, and hear from our speakers, uh, what I would like to do is uh, reach out to each of the commissioners and have them say a few words. So starting with the first commission, uh, I will uh, reach to, uh, Commissioner Tobias from the first congressional district. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Ford, and good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Tobias, and I am from the city of Racine. I work for Racine Unified School District, supporting the superintendent and the Board of Education. Um, I would like to share that being on the People's Map Commission is an outstanding opportunity, not only for myself, but for others listening and watching this evening to learn more about redistricting which is a vital part of the democratic process. And I look forward to objectively looking at data and ensure the state of Wisconsin and my community in the first congressional district have fair and nonpartisan district maps. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tobias. Uh, from our second congressional district, uh, Commissioner Anthony. Thank you, Chairman Ford. I'm Ruben Anthony. I'm currently the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Madison. I've been a resident of Wisconsin for 38 years. Uh, 24 of those years I spent um, as a government employee. Uh, 20 of those years I spent with the Department of Transportation. So I had an opportunity to get some experience with uh, working with maps. Uh, but here I want to serve on this uh, commission uh, because I do believe everything that you heard Chairman Ford talk about in terms of having a representative uh, bureaucracy. I, I feel like uh, that um, Wisconsin has become uh, the poster child for gerrymandering, and yet uh, we have the technology uh, today that can get us beyond gerrymandering. I think that you know we have uh, a very diverse commission, and, and this is how it should be done. Uh, we've got voices from all walks of life. And so when we have our elections uh, during the state, we expect that there will be a representative bureaucracy and doing the redistricting will get us there. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, you know, many of us are gonna learn on this commission as we go, but from my standpoint, uh, I'm gonna give you my best and my most objective you know, point of view you know, as we proceed. And, and, and I'm sure that the other commissioners will do the same thing and I'm honored to represent the second congressional district. And, and I'm really looking for some great conversations and I'm looking for some great outcomes, but we can't get there without your input. So I wanna thank you uh, for being available tonight. And I look forward to engaging with you during this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Anthony. From our third congressional district, Commissioner McClellan. Thank you, Chair. 
My name is Anne Marie McClellan, and I live in Menominee, Wisconsin, the one on the northwest side of the state in the third congressional district. I'm recently retired, having spent 25 years being employed in the design and conduct of oncology clinical trials. And before that, I was employed as an industrial statistician in the brewing industry. Uh, my education includes a bachelor's in microbiology and a master's in statistics and an MBA. So I wanna say that I really am honored to be on this commission. Voting rights is one of my passions. You know, it's fundamental to our democracy, which I think we all love. And through the League of Women Voters, I volunteer to help register people um, and educate voters on issues. You know, one of the explanations that we hear why people don't bother to vote is that their vote doesn't count. And gerrymandering is part of the reason why I think people feel this way. So I, I really am committed to listening to people's opinions on the redistricting problems that we have in today's maps. I'm looking forward to educating myself on the details of the map uh, and the data that is used in the map drawing process and working with my fellow commissioners here to create a redistricting process and a map that is fair. And thank you all um, for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Congressional McClellan. Um, Commissioner Rangall from the 4th Congressional District. Thank you, Chair Ford. Good evening. Uh, my name is Benjamin Rangel. I'm originally from Racine, Wisconsin, and currently live in Milwaukee here in the 4th District. I studied uh, political science at UW-Madison and went to grad school for my master's in international affairs at Marquette University. Uh, but my passion for fair maps in government was really inspired by my grandfather. You can actually see behind me here uh, was an alderman in Racine and instilled upon me a passion for civic en engagement. Uh, now, though, that passion continues as a high school government teacher here in the city. And I am very honored and humbled to be serving the state of Wisconsin and my fellow Wisconsinites in an effort to make sure our maps are fair and nonpartisan. I know today partisan politics has divided many people throughout the country, but I am hopeful that my fellow commissioners and I can earn your trust and we as a state can overcome our political differences for the sake of our state's future. Uh, finally, having lived in Wisconsin my whole life, I know the best way to end any introduction is to say, go Pack Go. There you go. Thank you, Commissioner Rangel. Uh, from the 5th fifth, fifth Congressional District, um, Commissioner Ramft. Thank you, Chair Ford. Uh, my name is Susan Ramft. I live in Wauwatosa with my husband and three children. I'm the Vice President of Global uh, Human Resources for Manpower Group. Uh, my educational background is in international relations, um, education and public policy from St. Norbert College in Green Bay and Harvard University. Um, I applied to represent the 5th District um, because I believe deeply um, in the foundations of our democracy and obviously district maps are critical to that. Um, I look forward to working with, learning from, um, and engaging with my commission colleagues, um, the people of Wisconsin, those who have joined us tonight, and the experts in this field. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Ram. Uh, from our 6th uh, District, Commissioner Prentice. Thank you, Chair Ford, and good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa Prentice, and I'm the commissioner for the 6th Congressional District. I live in Sheboygan, and I am a librarian and currently the public services manager at Mead Public Library here in the city of Sheboygan. I also serve on the governing board for the Etude Group, which is a charter school within the Sheboygan Area School District, and I've been involved with our local chapter of the League of Women Voters as well. One of the foundational professional tenets of librarianship is to uphold democracy and promote civic engagement. To that end, fair, accurate, and representative maps are essential to a fully functioning democracy where all votes are equal and all citizens have a voice in their government. Unfair maps have a direct impact on civic engagement by increasing voter apathy and distrust of government Creating fair maps is essential to a healthy democracy where all citizens are empowered to participate in good faith. 
my professional training as a librarian has prepared me for critical examination of sources and perspectives on a variety of issues. I understand the importance of database decision making while also valuing differing points of view. So I look forward to serving the 6th District and the state of Wisconsin as part of this commission. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Princess. From our 7th District, Commissioner Bissonnette. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Commissioners. Um, good evening. I'm, I, I'm absolutely excited to be here this evening. Um, representing the 7th Congressional District means uh, just an absolute tremendous amount to me. Um, the 7th Congressional District, if you look at a map, we, we make up a, a huge part of the state of Wisconsin. And, uh, and it's a part of Wisconsin I, that I absolutely love to be a part of. Um, right now, I, uh, I sit on the Board of Regents for the Lucudere Ojibwe uh, Tribal College. And, uh, and my full-time full job is, uh, is a Dean of Students for the Lucudere Ojibwe um, K-12 School. Um, what I love about the whole idea of being a part of this commission and having this voice from the Northern part of the state um, is I absolutely believe to the bottom of my heart that most of us up here are dead set, right in the middle kind of folks. Um, I live in a county, I live in Sawyer County. Uh, to my knowledge, I think we have about seven, seven stoplights in this county. So that's a, um, that's a, a voice that's a little bit different than downstate. So um, I'm absolutely excited about being a part of this. I'm passionate about equality. Um, I'm passionate about representation. So um, I'm absolutely eager to um, uh, just be an be a advocate for fair maps and be a voice for fair maps um, because the representation um, is key. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bissonnette. Uh, and last but not least, from our 8th Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Phillips. Thank you, Chair Ford. I have been a cancer physician associated with Theta Care in Appleton in the Fox Valley for 21 years. And in the past year, I have been working closely with the statewide Fair Maps effort advocating for nonpartisan redistricting in Wisconsin. I think my motivation mainly came from my children. You know, I, I feel like most of us that our democracy is a bit of a mess and, and uh, I'd like to ensure a better democracy for our children. And when you start to look into why is our government so dysfunctional, you quickly hone down to the effects of gerrymandering. So it's a great honor to have been selected to represent the 8th District of Wisconsin on the People's Map Commission. The 8th District has been extremely active in pushing for this goal of fair election maps. And many of you that have done this advocacy work are, are in attendance or you're watching tonight and the commission thanks you for that work. For instance, in the 8th District, Winnebago and Outagamie counties, you have overwhelmingly passed referendum in support of nonpartisan uh, redistricting. Brown and Door County, will vote in November, the voters will have a referendum and it will pass heavily. Calumet, Marinette, Oconto, Shawano County boards have passed resolutions in favor of nonpartisan redistricting and we'll take up a referendum question later. So all of the above is only possible due to the very strong grassroots efforts of the people in these counties of the 8th District pushing their county governments to take action. So we thank you. Tonight, we are hosting this hearing in a virtual manner in the 8th District. So it is also my honor as the 8th District Commissioner to thank all of you citizens who have signed up to give public comment. Please know that this commission deeply appreciates what you are doing. The commission appreciates both those giving comments who live in the 8th District, but also the virtual visitors from outside the 8th District. We appreciate the time that you're taking away from your busy everyday life. We appreciate the research that you have done for your comments. The commission will remind you a little later in this hearing, but please understand that the comment period where all of you will be speaking 
will not be a time for debate or back and forth about what you are saying. However, the commission is listening and we are taking notes and we will further discuss the comments given tonight by the 8th district and by our visitors at debriefing meetings between the district hearings. The commission will use your comments in building evidence for the need for nonpartisan redistricting. This hearing overall is a great exercise in democracy. This People's Maps Commission very openly represents you, the people. The commission's ultimate role next spring will be to present election district maps to the legislature asked for also by the great majority of you, the people. And we start tonight in the 8th Congressional District of Wisconsin. So thank you, Chairman Porter. All right, thank you, Commissioner Phillips. Um, so next, what we'll do is um, we'll transition to our speakers. Uh, before we do that, uh, I'll introduce myself. I uh, did not do so. So I'm Chris Ford. I am the chair commissioner. I'll be sharing uh, commission duties with um, uh, Commissioner uh, Rangel. Um, I am a resident of Whitefish Bay, uh, and I am an emergency medicine physician in Milwaukee. I'm a Wisconsin transplant. Uh, I went to medical school here at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, went to residency at the University of Wisconsin Department of Emergency Medicine. Uh, and I am a, a father of two, under two, and a husband to uh, my very loving and caring wife, uh, who has really uh, stepped up uh, uh, for me to partake in this uh, as well. So the next thing we'll talk about we'll introduce our speakers here so um you know the concept of legislative districts the redistricting process itself and gerrymandering are very complex issues uh, and the impacts of those um, uh, complex issues on individuals and families and organizations uh, are equally complicated uh, to even us uh, we're pleased to have three subject matter um, experts today uh, this evening who will break down some of those uh, complexities for us uh, now, before we begin, uh, I ask my commissioners to please hold their questions until all the presenters have presented. Um, and then we'll go ahead and introduce our first um, uh, presenter who we're very fortunate to have. Uh, so our first presenter this evening will be Ruth Greenwood. Uh, Ruth is co-director of the Voting Rights uh, and Redistricting at the Campaign Legal Center. Uh, she is a Harvard Law School lecturer. Uh, and she's litigated two partisan gerrymandering cases uh, from the trial level all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, including the Gill versus Whitford, uh, which uh, arose out of the Wisconsin 2011 redistricting uh, efforts. Uh, Ruth, thank you so much uh, for taking time to participate here with us, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Chairman. And I would just like to say to everybody, it is such an honor to be here. I am so humbled having heard all your introductions. I mean, you are, you are just an amazing group of people. Um, uh, I, so thank you so much for having me here. The, the other thing I'll say about this um, is the good news is you're doing this. This is democracy. This is bringing people together. This is kind of what I dream about when I think of American democracy. You'll hear I'm not from this country. The thing I love about America is the civic engagement. And everywhere I go, I meet people um, you know, like you that care about your, your democracy. And so I really appreciate being here. Now, the bad news is just like what you said, um, this, is, this can be hard, right? During a partisan gerrymander is pretty easy. You have one goal, pick your party, get advantage for them. That's what you do. But drawing a fair plan that actually encompasses the values and communities within your state, that can be tough, right? You need to make some decisions about which um, values you care about. Um, and when they come and they compete with each other, you need to decide which one to prioritize. So I'm really glad that you've got a lot of experts coming to speak with you. I'm glad that you are already amazingly trained and educated. I don't think you have any issues with, you know, the complexity of this. You're, you all seem <laughs> far, far too well educated. But um, uh, uh, the thing that I think will be hard is that you need to listen to everybody that comes along and hear what they have to say and think about, you know, what community means to them. Um, and it sounds as though you're willing to do that. So you're going to be just fine. Um, okay, so um, if we can go to the first slide. Um, the uh, reason uh, that redistricting happens every 10 years uh, is because the census happens every 10 years. So the constitution has a clause um, that requires there to be a census of the people. Um, and that happens in the zero year. So now 2020 happened in 2010, 2000 and so on. Um, and, and the reason that redistricting happens after that 
um, is not just because of reapportionment. I've put up here the slide that shows you um, at least one university's demography department predicted which states might be gaining and losing congressional seats. Um, it looks from there like they think Wisconsin will stay the same. So maybe that makes your job a little easier. <laughs> Always adding and removing gets hard. Um, but the reason that all of the redistricting occurs after that is because in the 1960s, um, the Supreme Court said that um, districts have to be drawn according to the principle of one person, one vote. That is, you can't have 10,000 people in one district and 100,000 people in the other district. Um, that, that wouldn't be fair, right? When, you, when, um, <laughs> when everybody says, call your congressman, even before I was a citizen, I still called my congressman and was able to say, hey, um, you know, I think you should do this or I think you should do that. And that to me is part of participatory democracy. And so when the new census data come out, we then are able to say, well, now the districts, some of them have too many people, some of them have too few people. And so we need to redraw them. So that's why we do this um, usually in the one year. So, so in 2021, okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so, oh, and just one more so we can see the state. Okay, so just to break this down uh, simply for you, um, uh, I, I, we can talk about Wisconsin, but this is just a, a very basic example of a state. You'll see here on the left that I have 20 blue voters and 25 red voters. So um, there are slightly more red voters than blue. So if you were gonna do a neutral plan, you'd think, okay, we should have more red districts than blue districts. You'll see here as well that I've put in some examples of incumbents. That's really just so I can explain on the next slide some ways that you can gerrymander. So because in America, um, we have a single member district system, right? You draw a district around people. Um, and in that, in that neutral plan I showed you, um, you, you would have two blue districts and three red districts. Now there are blue and red people in all of those districts, but they, they work together um, to elect someone. Now, if the election swings a lot one way, you might get more red people elected. If it swings the other way, you might get more blue. But that's what we generally think of in terms of partisanship as a neutral plan. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Right, so um, you will probably hear these terms, cracking, packing, kidnapping. I've also heard stacking and tacking. You can probably make up your own. Um, the, the main thing to know about these is that uh, the way to gain uh, advantage along some line, so usually it is along partisan lines, but it could be racial or religious, or it could be language lines or other things. But let's assume here on partisan lines. If you look at that district on the left, even though there are more red voters than blue voters, um, they have now drawn it. So there's only one district that would elect um, a candidate of choice of the blue community. And there are four that would elect a candidate of choice of the red community. And the way they have done that, if you look in that district one, there are lots of blue dots and only two red dots. So we call that packing, right? You make it hyper, hyper blue. It's like a 90% blue district, that's packing. And then in order to do that, around the edges, you crack away the blue voters. So the blue voters that, you know, in district two that used to be able to contribute to a candidate of choice of the blue community getting elected, can't do that anymore. There are too many red voters there. So we call that cracking. So basically whatever you are trying to maximize um, along demography, you do it by cracking and packing packing in the people you don't like and then cracking the people you don't like at the edges so the people you do like get influence everywhere. Now, on the right-hand side, I've just shown you this example of what they call kidnapping. Um, so this would be if the blue voters say, I'm sorry, so the blue people say they're drawing a, a district plan and they're like, look, we're not gonna be able to draw a gerrymander for ourselves. We're only gonna get these two out of the five districts. But they say, I can be sneaky. I know that the incumbent you know, lives here. And if I put them into district two, then maybe we can beat them because there's already a blue incumbent there. And then maybe we can work to try to you know, flip district three or district five because there are no incumbents in those districts. So even though you might have the, you know, the majority or a minority of the districts, there are tricky things you can do around the edges um, to try to gain advantage. Um, interestingly, a good, a good historical example um, of, of kidnapping um, was when uh, the plan was drawn when um, President Obama was uh, still uh, a state senator um, and they drew him into a district 
um, outside of Bobby Rush's district, basically. He'd run against Bobby Rush for Congress and they made it clear that he wasn't going to be able to run in that district and challenge um, Bobby Rush again. So this type of thing happens all the time and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it. So that gets us to the hypotheticals. Um, let's move on, if we can go to the next slide and talk about um, what actually, uh, what, what the considerations are that you have as you're drawing plans. So the one thing I would say for all of this is that it is important that you are conscious of what you're doing. Um, I think I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, oh, why don't we be race blind or partisan blind, or let's not look at, I don't know where the roads are or the rivers are. Um, I would say the opposite. I would say, look at all the data, be aware of the consequences of all the decisions that you are making. Um, you know, that these, these lines might be invisible, but they have concrete consequences. Um, and so uh, this very first example is just population equality. And this just shows you how you calculate it, right? How many are above, in this very small example, the ideal size is 200 people. In one district, we have nine above. In one district, we have nine below. Add them together, you get 18. 18 divided by 200, which is the ideal number, gets you to 9%. Now, for congressional districts, the, um, the requirement is generally that you have population equality almost down to the, the person. Um, for state legislative districts, the federal law says you can have a deviation up to 10%. But historically, Wisconsin has had deviations that are pretty small, like um, de de a decent amount below 10%. So that is a constraint, right? That is it is a requirement of the federal law. And so it's something that you have to consider. Now, if it was the only thing you had to consider, um, there would be a trillion or a trillion billion or something um, maps that you could draw because there are lots of ways to draw 99 equal districts um, you know, for, for the state legislature, for example. So um, if we can move on to the next slide, um, <laughs> I wanted to impart to you how important um, I consider communities to be um, and the Voting Rights Act. And so this is literally my wedding cake. Um, my husband and I are both redistricting nerds and we put this on our, on our cake and people um, sometimes refer to it as the gerrymandered cake. This is not a gerrymander. This is a picture of the Illinois fourth congressional district and it's my favorite district. Um, and, and the reason is this, uh, it was drawn by a court in the 1990s because on the, it, it sits around the city of Chicago. There's a bump on the top there that you can see, that's the Northwest side of the city of Chicago and a bump on the Southwest side of the city of Chicago. Now, why do you join those two with this strange looking line? Well, that's because they care about communities. These two districts involve predominantly a Puerto Rican community and a Mexican American community. And they're joined. And that has meant that since the 1990s, that district has elected a candidate of choice of the Latino community to Congress. But in the middle is the west side of Chicago, and that is predominantly African-American. And so if you were to split that in half, that would mean that the African-American community couldn't elect their candidate of choice. And so even though this district looks weird, you know, and people say things about it and so on, I think it is a wonderful district because it cares about communities. It cares about the two communities that it joins and it cares about the community in the middle that it doesn't disrupt. So when it comes to the Voting Rights Act, um, my understanding in, in Wisconsin is there are probably, and it would depend on the new numbers, um, probably six districts um, that, sh that should ensure that, it, this is in the state legislature, that the uh, black community can elect a candidate of their choice. Um, and probably one or two districts where the Latino community should be able to elect the candidate of their choice. Um, and so when you are, are taking testimony, you should hear from the people in, the, in that area, right? Um, what do people consider to be their community? Um, I know that um, my professor, Nate Persily, is often um, a professor from, from way back, um, is often a special master in courts. And in some places he looks at, you know, just demography and he says, oh, okay, this looks like these people are all the same, let me put them together. And inevitably somebody comes back and says, no, 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 I know that on the census it looks like we're the same, but actually we have very different preferences. Um, and so that's why something like this commission is so important. Um, I cannot draw a really good plan for Wisconsin. I'm not from Wisconsin. I, I know data, I can look at data, but I don't know your communities. I mean, I know some of them having litigated for a while, but those things change over time, right? Um, 
uh, one example, actually, if we go to the next slide, I can, I can talk about this using the map. Um, so I, I pulled this up. I was trying to think of a, a map to show you that there are so many ways we can think about communities. So here you can see there are roads. So sometimes um, everybody has to drive along a certain highway to get to a job or to get to school um, or I don't know, to get to sports on the weekend. And so that highway can actually form a community and you might wanna draw a district that follows a highway. In other places, it'll be no, no, no. I, and I'm telling you this because I've talked with people all over the country and they say to me, no, in our community, look, the lake is the thing. If you're on this side of the lake, that's one. But if you're on that side of the lake, that's a different community. Um, sometimes it can be rivers. It, it can be all types of natural geography that can influence what, a, what is considered a community. Um, so for example, I know that we are doing this um, in the 8th Congressional District near Appleton. Um, so uh, in the 2011 plan, Appleton was split in a different way to how it had been previously split. Um, now, I considered that to be a poor decision only because I know the reason that was done was to advantage one political party. As for what it meant for the communities, they, they never asked, right? There were just a couple of people in a room deciding what everybody else in the state should have to live with. What you have the amazing opportunity to do here is to actually have someone, well, I think one of you is from Appleton, right? Come in and say, hey, um, where, where do our communities sit? Which way should we go? I know that just south of Appleton are Nina and Menasha. Um, historically, they've been in the same district. In the 2011 plan, they were put into different districts. I can't tell you whether they should be in the same district or different districts, but the people in those communities will be able to tell you. They can tell you who's like which area is growing, which is declining, what groups of people work together and what people don't. The, um, the, the easiest example to think of is uh, the Door County Peninsula. So that doesn't have enough people to make up a single legislative district. So once you put Door County in a district, the next decision you make is based on so many factors. Do you go to the West, into Green Bay? Do you think that that community is, uh, is part of the community of Green Bay? Do you go South down to Manitowoc because you think that is part of it? Do you decide that you don't want to have districts that have very homogenous communities? And in fact, you want to have heterogeneous communities for some sort of local level of democracy. Um, these are decisions that you will need to make with every click that you put on a map. <laughs> and so every time you click and you select something, I would suggest to you that you have a reason for it. You have a reason that is based in what the people have told you um, and, and in what the data has told you. Um, the, uh, the other factors here that I have highlighted are compactness and contiguity. So contiguity, um, in Wisconsin, you maybe all know this, but there are lots of cities and towns that are not contigu contiguous. Contiguous is I can walk around the whole thing and I never have to leave, um, usually. In Wisconsin, though, you have places that have little islands, right? There's a city and then it's adopted this island here or that island there, and the bit in between is not the city. Um, generally in Wisconsin, if you keep the, the, the city as a whole or part of you know, the city together, that is still considered uh, contiguous. And so that can result in things that people from other states may say look strange, um, but for you, it might look perfectly normal because that's exactly what you consider to be a community. Um, so uh, you, you can have, as you draw maps, different layers available, uh, you know, towns and, and wards are really important, is my understanding in Wisconsin, counties as well. And so you wanna be aware of what they are and where they are. And if there's a count, there are actually a number of uh, towns that split over the two sides of a county line. And so if you're trying to keep um, political subdivisions together, uh, you, you sometimes can't keep the county together and the city together because they can't all fit into one district. So the question is, do you split the city in two and keep the county whole, or do you keep the city whole but split around the county? Again, I can't tell you what the right answer is, but I hope that you make these decisions consciously. You decide, well, in this case, this city really is a community and should be together. But in another place, you know, that city or town really has a very clear east side and west side and they can be in, in, in different districts. Um, all of those decisions that you make will impact people's lives. So um, if you have uh, a school board that is split across districts, you know, that, uh, that will mean that even though somebody has one school board to go to to advocate for their children's education, 
the people in that district are going to have, so there are going to be people in two different districts. So when they go up to the legislature, um, when they go up to Congress, they're, they're going to different people. Again, that could be a good thing, that could be a bad thing, but please at least make that decision consciously and aware of what the trade-offs are between the different um, things you are trying to do. The other thing that I've noted here is compactness. So compactness is a traditional redistricting criteria, but it is also something that is written into um, the Wisconsin State Constitution. Now, given that I've shown you my wedding cake, which everybody knows is a district that is not traditionally compact, compactness is measured in about 15 different ways, but often it's kind of what's close to a circle. Um, I think that compactness has value, um, but it can't be the only thing it has value. If you just draw a bunch of squares, what you get are a bunch of squares, right? And so if, if that is the only thing you care about, well, that's fine, but usually it is one thing to care about. Now, what are some reasons to care about compactness? Um, one of the things can be that when, um, if you're trying to encourage more competition in a district, and have a challenger have a real chance to challenge an incumbent, having a district that is compact or at least connected by roads so that they can travel around and campaign can actually have a real effect. If you spread a district a long way along and it takes, you know, they can't get to the whole district um, in a day or in two days, uh, then that can make it harder to be, to be a challenger. This is assuming we go back to the world where we can knock on people's doors. So um, when you're thinking about compactness, Again, I would encourage you to think about what values you get from compactness. You know, does it mean that the community can all meet each other or you can have town hall meetings and people can get together? Does it mean you've encouraged competition? Um, and then there's the other side of it, right? Where you, you've, you've sacrificed compactness and you've said, well, we don't need to have a district that's quite so compact. Well, why have you done that? If you've done that to try to ensure that a community of color can elect a candidate of their choice, to the state legislature or sorry, the state assembly or to Congress, um, then that's, I think, a really good reason to do it, right? Um, it's complying with federal law, but, but it's also respecting historically disenfranchised communities. Now, if you have drawn a really non-compact district because you really wanna get advantage for one party, I would say to you, please don't do that. That is a terrible reason <laughs> to draw a non-compact district. In fact, the original gerrymander, which you, you may have seen, oh, I should have put a picture of it, was the Elbridge Gerry's salamander. And so the reason back then in 1812, when it was drawn, it was drawn around um, the city of Boston. And it, it was drawn because um, Elbridge Gerry was the governor and he wanted this district to make sure he could get his party elected to the state Senate, which meant that he could get whatever he wanted through. Now we could tell then that that was a partisan gerrymander because it had a really funny shape, right? They had put together all these crazy towns um, and you look at it and you go, something's going on there, right? That's a little weird. Uh, today, you can draw a partisan gerrymander that is hidden in plain sight. You know, we, we, you can draw nice, you know, round districts, you can have some highways and rivers and roads and so on in them, but it can still be a partisan gerrymander if the effect is that uh, when everybody goes to vote, one side's votes are contributing to more candidates being elected than the other side's votes. Um, you, you probably all know that in, in Wisconsin in 2011, um, we had at least a district court find um, that the, the map was a partisan gerrymander. Um, also in Maryland, a case I was involved with, uh, the congressional plan was found to be a partisan gerrymander in favor of Democrats. Um, so you can, you can draw these plans that look fine, but are actually not fine. Uh, the, the thing, as I say, is that if you wanna draw a really non-compact district, have a reason for it. If you wanna draw a compact district, have a reason for it. Um, similarly with contiguity, you might decide, hey, we do wanna make it that people can drive all around their district. And so even though this city has a non-contiguous piece, let's connect it, right? Let's put the bit in between in, into that district. Um, the, the, the other time this comes up is with population deviations, right? Sometimes you might need to have a district that's a little bit higher or a little bit lower than two or 3% deviation. Maybe you're doing that to keep a town together. Um, you know, or maybe you're keeping a school district in, you know, a college, you have lots of colleges and universities in Wisconsin, maybe you're keeping them together. Um, again, I would say that the, the hope is that when you make those decisions, you are making them consciously so that you can ensure that communities 
um, have a role in democracy. You can decide what that role is. Do you want that role to be partisanship? Do you want that role, um, you know, to, to uh, I don't know, to, to be purely about race? Do you want that role to be about religion? But choose what you care about um, and, and try to um, advance those goals. Um, and then this is where I want to speak, not just to the commission, but to all the people out there um, who are watching. Um, the commission is obviously made up of incredible people. They are very impressive and it is, um, uh, <laughs> it's quite um, humbling to speak before them. And so when you come for public comments, I'm sure you will have that experience too. But they're not an expert on every area of Wisconsin. That's why they need you. They need people out there to tell them what's going on in your local community. And if two of you disagree, that's great. Fine. Explain what the disagreement is. Let's have at it. Let's talk about how democracy should be and how representation could be affected by the different ways that lines are drawn. Um, and I guess um, in all of the time I've spent driving around um, Wisconsin, I haven't found, even though everybody is Wisconsin nice, nobody is backward in coming forward about politics. <laughs> um, and so I hope that everybody can um, give their uh, thoughts uh, freely and that they will be considered by the commission. Um, and that that will mean the commission can take into account all of these various considerations that they have to consider. Um, so just to go over them again, there's equal population, right? When you get the new census data, you will be able to see how many people there are in each district. You wanna get the total population to be roughly equal in congressional districts and close to equal in the state um, assembly and Senate districts. Uh, next, you wanna care about the Voting Rights Act and in making sure that people of color are able to elect their candidates of choice. Um, the, the nice thing there, I guess, is you have a guide in the districts that are currently there. That said, maybe you'll hear testimony that they're terrible and they should be drawn differently. Um, I have no doubt that there will be groups that can submit plans to you that you can consider. Um, so that's the Voting Rights Act. And then after that, you have what I mentioned here, compactness, contiguity and communities. Um, and I would just hope that even though compactness is easy to measure, right, you put it into a, a, a piece of software and it tells you the number is something and contiguity is easy to measure. Um, I, I wouldn't just try to maximize them because they're easy to measure. Communities are hard to understand, they're hard to measure, they're hard to identify, but that is where the real work of democracy comes in. And so I hope that as you go around and you work out which communities are the important communities, you can find a way to draw a map where people feel like they have a voice. They have someone to go to who is going to represent them. They have, um, I mean, one thing I've heard a lot in Wisconsin is that people want competitive districts. If that's something that you decide is an important criterion, I hope that you draw it. So it's not just that I get the same person every time. It's that there's a real chance that if that person isn't doing a good job, that, that you know, little constituent can call, can work together to get somebody else elected so they um, their rights can be represented in the state assembly and in the state senate and in congress. So I'm very happy um, to take your questions, um, but this is hopefully uh, a little bit of an introduction to the important things to think about when you're redistricting. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's the Whitford plaintiffs at the Supreme Court. I just love them so much and so I wanted to put them there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Um, it's very helpful and our commissioners will definitely have some questions available for you uh, coming up here, but thank you very much. Um, getting along the lines of community and uh, actually Appleton, uh, that was a great segue, uh, Ruth. Um, our second presenter uh, is Karen Nelson. Uh, she is uh, the diversity and inclusion coordinator for, App for the Appleton Mayor's Office. That's a part of the uh, eighth district uh, where our commissioner Phillips is from, uh, where we're uh, coming from you from tonight, virtually. Leveraging her experience uh, at the local level, uh, Karen will share how uh, redistricting impacts local communities. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I am a civil servant leading diversity and inclusion in the mayor's office for the city of Appleton. I also serve as vice chair of the Outagamie County Complete Count Committee for Census 2020. And additionally, a member of the League of Women Voters Appleton chapter. Today, amidst a lot of pain and suffering, we must do everything possible 
for the protection of the unfortunate and weak in our community, giving voice and power to those who have gone invisible for too long. Despite COVID-19 presenting real challenges, we need to do everything that we can to protect our democracy. And that's why I'm sitting before you here as you sit on the commissioner's board. Everything we care about as Wisconsinites rise and fall on our ability to complete a safe and accurate census count. Roads, bridges, infrastructure, gun safety, climate change, justice reform, immigrant rights, educational equity, economic security, and health care, just to name a few. We will not have a mulligan. There's no do-over. This opportunity only happens every 10 years. Everyone has a seat at the table by participating in the census, and that's how we get to fair maps and fair districting. All people of color, children, immigrants, the homeless, and of course, those on the other side of the digital divide that we're now learning more about in the midst of this COVID-19. Unfortunately, voter suppression and racial exclusion from civic participation is so American that to speak up against it makes some people question that person's patriotism. I sit boldly before you tonight to let you know that it's time for our politicians, regardless of party, to compete on a leveled playing field and not a jerry-rigged one. I'm asking you commissioners to please demand equal districts by population simply, plain and simple. No jerry-rigging, no playing games. And also the second thing I'm asking is that you demand transparent process. We have gone beyond the days where this should be decided by two guys in a back room and no one knows what's going on. This is a watershed moment in our country. To the viewers out there, if you've already responded to Census 2020, I say thank you. If you haven't, it's not too late, but time is running out. The target deadline now is October 5th. And so I implore you, if you have not yet completed the census, we need to get this count right so we can have fair maps that you would please re respond online at www.2020census.gov or by calling 844-330-2020. Or if you still have it, you can still mail back your completed form or answer your door when enumerators come to your door who are still knocking right now. Commissioners, back to you. Governance belongs in the hands of the people, not just a couple of guys, as I mentioned earlier. 72% of Wisconsinites want fair maps. Let's give the people what they want. I implore you to seize the seminal moment to finally create fair maps because we, the people, deserve it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Karen. So before our uh, next speaker, we are going to take a short break. Um, uh, I want everyone to kind of think about those presentations and commissioners think about some of the questions uh, that you have for both of our speakers. Um, and so we'll be back at 6.40 p.m. Uh, for our third and final speaker.
All right, welcome back commissioners and everyone out there. Um, our next uh, speaker really needs no introduction from me. Um, just to kind of share an aside for that, that Ruth, uh, in the same vein that she had, uh, you know, my wedding ring is actually a half dollar uh, with the date 1965 on it uh, to represent the date that the Voting Rights Act was uh, enacted and signed into law. Um, our next speaker uh, during his time, uh, both as Attorney General and before that, uh, has actually spent a lot of his career maintaining uh, that Voting Rights Act, uh, as well as being a voice for people who uh, otherwise won't have that voice. Uh, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Eric Holder. Uh, he is the former acting U.S. Attorney General. Uh, he serves uh, currently as the chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, uh, and he has served uh, appointed positions uh, for a multitude of presidents, including President Obama, Clinton, and Reagan. Uh, so without uh, further ado, Mr. Holder, uh, the floor is yours. My pleasure to join you virtually this evening for uh, the first meeting of the People's Maps Commission in Wisconsin. Uh, I want to applaud, applaud first off uh, Governor Evers for setting up this commission to show that uh, the people of Wisconsin, that there, there's a better, there is a more fair way to draw the maps than the broken status quo. I also want to sincerely thank all of you for taking part in this, this very important process. Because what you're talking about this evening and the work that you'll do in the coming months is focused on redistricting but the implications are much broader than simply a set of maps. The work that you are doing is fundamentally about ensuring that you have a government that represents the people to ensure that the people of Wisconsin actually have a say in who wins political office. And just as importantly, that you are able to hold those elected officials accountable if they fail to live up to your expectations. Now, when John Adams was contemplating how representative government should work in the United States, he said, and I quote, the principal difficulty lies and the greatest care should be employed in constituting this representative assembly. It should be in miniature, an exact portrait of the people at large. It should think, feel, reason, and act like them." Unquote. Now ask yourself, has the Wisconsin legislature over the past decade been in miniature, an exact portrait of the people at large? Has the leadership in the legislature truly reflected the feeling and thinking of the people of this great state? I do not think that it has. I think that unfortunately that the people of Wisconsin have suffered under some of the worst gerrymandering in the country. Now, while gerrymandering has been around since the earliest days of our country, it is now worse than ever. According to an analysis done by Princeton University, the gerrymandering that occurred in 2011 was the most egregious in at least the last half century. Self-serving politicians use new technology, in a secret process to give themselves the greatest possible partisan advantage. Now, these, these are simply facts. In multiple elections in the past decade, the people of Wisconsin have cast more votes for Democratic candidates running for the state assembly, but Republicans continue to control about two thirds of the seats. This is simply not how a representative government is supposed to work. What you have right now is a government controlled by politicians who handpick their voters. This practice weakens our democracy by making some voters' ballots more powerful than others. And it also does damage well beyond election day. When elections are manipulated through partisan or racial gerrymandering, when districts are drawn to lock in power for one party, it means that politicians are more concerned with a primary challenge than with a general election. By eliminating competitive general elections, it allows politicians to cater to the special interest donors and the extremes of their base instead of to all of you, the people that they are supposed to represent. Well, let me give you one example of what I mean. Here in Wisconsin, people have found roughly 80% support for the expansion of background checks to include all firearms sales. Now, it's hard to find 80% support for just about anything in this country right now, but four out of five people in Wisconsin agreed that there should be stronger background checks. So around this time last year, Governor Evers called the legislature into a, a special session to debate and to vote on proposals to expand background checks and to help reduce gun violence. So what did the leadership and the legislature do in response? They did nothing. They gaveled into session and then they closed it just a minute later. That is the kind of political cowardice that you see when people lock in legislative power through gerrymandering. Now, it's hard for people to understand how an issue can be so popular 
but their elected representatives refuse to take action. And then even worse, those same politicians face no consequence at the ballot box. And we've seen this on a whole range of issues over the past decade. Gerrymandering's corrosive effect on our politics has contributed to gridlock and polarization. And that then leads to cynicism that too many Americans feel about our government. Gerrymandering is truly an attack on our democracy. We now have politicians who are unaccountable to the people. And they once more care about, they, they care about more about holding on to power than doing right by their constituents. And that is why it's not a coincidence that the states with the most extreme gerrymandering have also used that power to further restrict access to the ballot box through discriminatory voter ID laws. Now, in North Carolina, a federal judge found that a voter ID law targeted African Americans with, quote, almost surgical precision. In Texas, a voter ID law allows people using, uh, allows people to vote using a concealed carry permit, but not a University of Texas student ID. Here in Wisconsin, one study found that your voter ID law prevented up to 45,000 people from voting in 2016. So on a whole number of levels, this is a moment in our history in which our democracy is being tested. Our system of government is being tested. Now, I don't mean to sound hyperbolic or to scare you, but we can't take our democracy for granted. It's fine to be frustrated with our government and to be dissatisfied with the status quo. I know that I am, but this is not a time for despair. This is a time for action. So I applaud you for all the work that you are doing. The fact is that this problem of gerrymandering will be, not be fixed on its own. We know that we can't count on politicians alone to fix the problem because it goes against their self-interest. You are, like so many other Americans right now, answering the call of active citizenship. You're going to do the hard work of, of fixing a, a structural issue that is plaguing our democracy, a structural issue that is holding Wisconsin back from making progress on a whole range of issues that are supported by the people. What you will do over the next few months is how redistricting should be done. You are following the model of states like Arizona and California that have nonpartisan citizen-led commissions that draw the maps. We know that an independent process works. It reduces partisanship. It increases competitiveness. And that is all I'm looking for in the redistricting process, a fair process and a fair outcome. I believe our elections should be decided through a battle of ideas, not which party was in charge of drawing the lines. This group assembled here this evening, this group of citizens, this group of people is where the power to draw the lines belong, not with self-interested politicians, but with the people. You will partake in a transparent process that allows people to speak up for their cities and their towns. You will do what is in the best interest of your communities, not a political party. Throughout our history, we have seen time and again what is possible when Americans come together to shape the fate of their state as well as the nation. Now, while it would be easy to, to tune out or to disengage from the political process right now, what is called for is greater participation. I hope that you do not underestimate the power that you all have as citizens. Your civic engagement with the People's Maps Commission and a whole range of other issues is needed now, today, as much as at any point in my lifetime. Ultimately, we, the people, have the power to decide what kind of country we want to have, what we want our governments to look like, and who we want to represent us in state legislatures as well as in Congress. The work that you're doing could not be more critical in the fight to ensure that we live up to the promise of our democracy. With fair maps, you can have a government and political leadership that is more inclusive, diverse, and brings more people to the table. With fair maps, you can have political debates that are not pushed to the extremes, but toward reasonable solutions and principled compromises. With fair maps, you can help lower the temperature in Madison and in the halls of Congress in Washington, DC. And with fair maps, you are more likely to have representatives that truly reflect the will of the people. So again, I wanna thank all of you for inviting me to join you this evening. This is a critical conversation that you're having and I'm honored that you asked me to be a part of it. I wish all of you the best of luck and I'll be following your work closely and I hope that we'll be able to see each other in person soon. This change is possible. This work is critical. We can succeed. Thank you. And thank you, Attorney General Holder. Um, 
uh, Attorney General Holder uh, graciously squeezed us between a couple of uh, formal commitments that he had. And as such, uh, unfortunately, he won't be able to participate in our Q&A, but uh, we uh, very much sincerely appreciate uh, you making time. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So guys, so we're now gonna uh, open up the floor to for any questions for the commissioners uh, that they may have for this evening's presenters, of course, um, uh, without uh, Attorney General Holder. Um, I'll go in order of congressional districts. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to start with the first congressional district. The way we're going to do it is we're going to ask one question per commissioner, uh, just as we kind of go down the line, uh, just at first. Uh, and then if there are any additional questions, uh, if we have time, we can kind of circle back and ask. Um, as we uh, previously discussed, if there are any commissioners that would like to pass for right now, that's okay. Um, uh, let me know when I call your name, and then we can come back to you if something kind of crops up. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin um, uh, with Commissioner Tobias from the 1st Congressional District. Thank you, uh, Chairman Ford. Uh, my question is for Ms. Greenwood. Just in your, um, in your studies and in your research, you know, what would you have considered a successful state that has fair maps? What is something to kind of, you know, look at just as, as a great example, if you will? I'd appreciate that. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and actually, Attorney General Holden mentioned um, that both Arizona and California are, are places to look at. Arizona has had um, a commission for 20 years and California just for the last 10. Um, but in both of those cases, they had a little bit like what you were doing now. They had people selected from across the state to be a commission. They went around the state and, and got feedback on things. Um, one of the things that was particularly good about California was they released draft plans and then had more meetings. So people could come back and say, look what you've done here. You actually put this group in this way or that way and comment on the real specifics um, of the particular draft plans. Um, and, then, and then they drew plans that have not been challenged. They've been fine. Well, in Arizona, there, there was a challenge, but they were upheld. Um, but they, they've been used throughout the decade. Um, and we've seen um, things that, that I care about, um, an increase in minority representation. We saw partisan fairness in both places. Um, so yeah, I'd say look to them. And, and I actually know um, that the commissioners from California are about to finish their period, right? They've, they're, there's going to be new commissioners, um, but they are ready to travel and certainly virtually can tell you all about their experiences um, and, and what they did well and what they did poorly and what they would have changed. Um, and so I'm sure that you can have some of them come and speak to you. Um, same thing with Arizona. Colleen Mathis, who is the chair there, um, is actually a native Midwesterner. She grew up in Illinois. Um, and she can tell you all about the, the process of, of drawing maps and taking in um, community uh, you know, comments, because I think it's just going to be hard for you to have so many comments and work out how to how to deal with them and how to put it together. But people have done it before and they can they can hopefully help you. Thank you so much, Ruth. That's actually uh, that's really good. Um, we can see if we can get in contact with those uh, commissioners as well. So um, from the second congressional district, uh, Commissioner Anthony. My question is directed to both Ms. Greenwood and Ms. Nelson. Um, you know, we've got a lot of great information from you tonight. Uh, what is the single most uh, important advice that you would give us? Of all the things that you said, what do you think is the most important advice that we can take as we move forward with this journey that we're on? Go ahead, Ms. Nelson. <laughs> yes, thank you. I said it in my prepared remarks and I'll be happy to repeat them again. And they are two. Number one, is for that equity, the equality. Let's just break up the population as it stands equally. And number two is to demand transparency. We no longer need to have two guys in a smoke-filled room in the back in the corner in the dark deciding where to draw the lines. And so transparency and equal distribution, those would be my, of, of all the things I said, if you remember nothing else, Please, I'm, I'm imploring you to do those two things, please. Um, they seem amazing. I would also just add from my perspective, 
um, that I would hope that you would um, make conscious choices, be aware of all of the data that is out there. Don't shield yourself from something. You know, I would, I would put all the data in there so you know the effects that the de decisions you make as to lines, what those effects will be. Um, there are amazing political scientists at the University of Wisconsin that I'm sure can help you project out all kinds of things. Um, and so I would just say, yeah, use the data, be aware of it um, so that when you make the decisions, you know the decisions that you have made um, and then you can see them play out. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, from the third congressional uh, uh, district, um, Commissioner McClellan. Yeah, hi, uh, this question is for Ms. Greenwood. Um, you talked about several criteria that we will use when we um, are making judgments about the districts. Uh, is it useful or will we even be able to rank those criteria in some matter of importance as we struggle with um, you know, how to make these lines on the map? Yeah, I mean, for one set of criteria, it's kind of a zero or a one, like either you have them contiguous or you don't. So in that way, you can just make sure that you comply with that. In some ways, either they are within the equal population bounds or not. Um, but when it comes to things like in, ensuring that you have fulfilled the rights under the Voting Rights Act, ensuring partisan fairness, protecting communities. Um, I don't think of these things as having one thing is more important than another. I think that it, it, sometimes if you if you, you could do that, you make you can make that a front for other decisions that you're making. I would just be clear, and, and I hope that maybe you are gonna produce this when you talk about, you know, produce a map, talk about the decisions that you made, right? We had to split this, but here's why we did it. Or, you know, we decided that we cared more in this case about partisan fairness than communities, but in this other place, we cared more about communities than others, right? So just wh whatever you decide, I would say, um, unfortunately, there isn't just an, an algorithm that you can kind of put in, um, I don't think. I think that people are complex and communities are complex. And so I think it's better to, to take that all in um, to, to come out with a result. Thank you. Uh, from the fourth uh, congressional district, uh, Commissioner Rangel. Uh, thank you, Chair Ford. Uh, my question is for Ms. Nelson. What, uh, you emphasized transparency a few times. What does transparency in a process like this look like to you? That's an excellent question. And the example I'd be happy to showcase for you is actually going on in uh, Iowa County. Uh, and uh, Iowa, the state of Iowa, they have an actual Facebook page where they are completely transparent and they're even showcasing the state of Wisconsin and the fact that Governor Evers has even uh, created this commission with you guys that uh, that I would really implore you to have that kind of level of transparency so that the, the whole general public can see what's going on. And I think it would also help to uh, increase that public buy-in so that people will understand what's going on and, and, and to be totally upfront and transparent up to and including a public Facebook page, just as one example. So thank you for asking. Thank you. From the uh, fifth congressional district, Commissioner Ramp. Thank you. My question is uh, for Ms. Greenwood. Um, given what you may project about the 2021 population distribution and how it might look, um, do you expect to see similar patterns as we had in 2010 and how much of our demographic mix is evolving or shifting? Um, thank you. That is a good question with I, I, the possibility of a very complex answer. Um, so I haven't looked into the specifics of the likely projections for 2020 for Wisconsin. Um, what I will say, though, is that um, when throughout the litigation, we were looking at whether you are, are sort of constrained, like there are only some things you can do because of the way the population exists, right? There was an argument that, well, there's a lot of Democrats in Milwaukee and Madison, and there's, you know, a lot of Republicans in the other areas there's nothing you can do about it. Um, that is not true. Um, and this is where algorithms can be helpful. We had various experts generate thousands of maps that you can draw a really big partisan gerrymander for Republicans. You can draw a really big partisan gerrymander for Democrats. Um, you can split every town, you can split no towns. Um, so obviously you would wanna update that um, and make sure that you have an analysis done uh, you know, to know what the bounds are that you're working with. If it turns out that your state you know, can only 
do something, one one thing or another, then you would want to know that because then that that would um, bound you. Um, but given that there are trillions or billions, or I'm not a mathematician, but there's some great number, a Google of <laughs> of plans that you can um, can draw. Usually, we have found in states that there is a way that you can get something that's fair in terms of partisanship, in terms of, in terms of racial representation, um, and in terms of communities. Thank you. Uh, from the um, uh, 6th Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Prentice. Thank you. Um, I uh, don't have a lot to add at this point. Um, many of the things I wanted to ask have been asked in some form or another. Although um, for Ms. Greenwood, I'm I'm really intrigued by what you talked about in terms of uh, community and, um, and, and your wedding cake uh, example, um, because looking at that, I'm, I, I see it as being um, the type of district we, we wouldn't want, but your explanation of it was really interesting to me. So I guess I'm, I would like a, a little more information on that and, and how you might see that playing out um, in Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about that district. Um, and, and so the thing with community in general is that it is really hard to define. I mean, m most places when you have, unfortunately, a bunch of men who sit in a room and don't let anybody else in and they just sort of make their decision, you never get to the point where you get to say, what is your community? Who, who do you think you know is your community? Now, through court actions, there are only some types of communities that we can um, litigate for, right? So in, in the case of that Illinois 4th Congressional District, that was through a court case that was saying that the Latino population were being left out of the political process. And so that was a district that could eventually be drawn. Um, the thing that you as a commission have the amazing freedom to do is not to just hit the floor, right? And be like, well, this is the very, you know, bare minimum that we have to do by law. You can say, well, what's actually good? Um, and so it might be that there is a strange shape you know, that is a good district, depending on the geography and depending on the, you know, the, the geographic distribution. Um, but, but there may not be, right? And, and as I say, the, the thing would be, I'm trying to think um, within Wisconsin, if there are particular areas. I, I mean, the main thing, I guess, is Door County is pretty, you know, um, there are only certain, you have to have the whole county in something and then, and then move out from there. Um, with many of the other places, similarly with the corners, right? You're, you're down in Racine, you've got to go north or west. Um, so when you're yeah, deciding on how you want to do it. I know also the city of Madison has lots of those little islands. And so sometimes the districts can look a little weird. Also, particularly because of the shape of the lakes, um, it can look strange, but maybe what you are doing is actually protecting you know, a community. The, the thing is, I would hope that you would understand that, that people in the community can talk about what their community is, not just we're protecting you know, a bunch of Democrats here or a bunch of Republicans. Uh, from the seventh congressional district, uh, Commissioner Bissonette. Yes, thank you. Um, and and uh, you know, lots of my questions have already been asked and answered. Um, I, I I do have a question. I am curious, Miss um, Greenwood. Um, can you kind of explain, like, is there good examples on? on the, the balance between compactness and population. Um, the seventh congressional district is, is gigantic. Um, there's more population in, um, in some of the other districts. And I'm just wondering what that balance or if there's a good example of that balance. Yeah, um, and I think it's interesting what you identified there because the, the thing with the seventh is that it has more land area, but it has the same population. It may have changed. As of the 2010 census, the population in that seventh district is the same as in all of the other districts. So even though when you do this mapping exercise, you look at a map, right? And when you look at a map, the thing that you see is the land area. <laughs> um, and so it can look like one thing is big and one thing is small or one thing is strewn across one way or another. Um, to me, I like to have honestly, like the dot density plan. So you have the density of where people are um, to get a sense of where, where communities are. Because sometimes, you know, suburbs can be really important. Other times they're less important. Um, you know, similarly with um, all sorts of things. I mean, sometimes there are, are, are prisons in places and, and as, as long as um, people in prison are allowed to vote, that can affect, um, you know, who, who's able to, to vote in that area. So um, the, the population should be equal. And, and I guess I want to um, double down on what um, Ms. Nelson said. There has been talk around the country of equalizing the citizen voting age population in each district um, as sort of a 
trying to get that as a marker of, of eligible voters, although it's not quite right because there are lots of people who can and can't vote for other reasons. But um, the I, I think what Ms. Nelson was saying about having the total population equal um, is what I would agree with. Um, there, there, there are two groups that get excluded if you do equalization by the citizen voting age population. There are non-citizens. Um, and I guess I have this very personal connection to that because I was a non-citizen who paid taxes and lived here and, and you know did all those things and really felt like I was part of the community. Um, I certainly couldn't vote back in the in Australia where I came from anymore. I, I didn't have an intention to return. Um, and so I considered myself to be in a congressional district, in a you know, legislative district. But then the other group that won't count are children. Um, and so if you have communities that have higher rates of children, those communities will really miss out. Um, and I am now a parent as well. And I know that I would do anything, you know, for my daughter. Um, and, and if I had multiple children, I would do anything for them. Um, and so if you equalize by total population, then even though some of the people can vote and, you know, the, the children can't vote, the people who can vote can vote for those children in those areas. So I think, um, you know, the Supreme Court since the 1960s has talked about having equal population, everybody's always equalized population across the whole country. And I think that that um, has been a revolution, right? The, the actual phrase in the court case from 1962 was that, you know, representatives don't represent trees and acres, they represent people. Um, and that doesn't mean trees and acres aren't important. You know, in the in the seventh, there's going to be all of this land that is going to be affected by the decisions that is different to the land in one of these smaller districts. Um, but th the people are the ones who can advocate for and represent the interests of, of that those lands. Yeah, kids definitely change the game, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from our eighth congressional district, uh, Commissioner Phillips. Thank you, Chairman Ford. I, I have a question for Karen Nelson. Uh, in your presentation in the beginning, you mentioned some specific areas where you feel that gerrymandering is affecting the 8th District and the whole state. Specifically, you mentioned the disabled population, and I'm going to ask you to comment maybe on that more in depth. But also, while we were having this meeting, I got a text from my son and I'll just read a little bit of it. Metro areas with the greatest number of new COVID cases relative to population. And this is all of the United States. Number one is Nina. Number three is Green Bay. Number four is Appleton in all of the United States. Do you think, ma'am, that that's coincidence or is there some relation there to what we're talking about tonight? I'm so glad that you asked. This is such a timely question from from him because we just had an update this morning uh, at 8.30 from Dr. Andrabe, the CEO and president of Theta Care, uh, highlighting the fact that we are now one of the hottest uh, areas in Northeast Wisconsin in the very cities that you've just named. Um, right now, we are very fortunate in the city of Appleton specifically that we are just getting to become a hotspot. We're thinking that a lot of it, uh, uh, conjecture uh, uh, driven by science from our health officer, uh, Kurt Eckebrecht in the city of Appleton is because of the, of the okay, how do I say this gently? Um, the more people begin to congregate around the social norms that would normally bring us together, such as sports, and so people going to more sports bars and, 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 and other opportunities to, uh, to re-congregate uh, some, some of our local places of worship are uh, beginning to reopen. And so you simply can almost look at the date of when that happens, when a game occurs, and literally paste it out two weeks hence. And that's when our numbers started going up. So starting around July and then into September uh, with our, our 4th of July holiday, and then of course with uh, Labor Day, and then now with the, uh, with the advent of the, uh, the sports teams, um, we are seeing our first true surge in the city of Appleton. We have been so careful and so proud of the fact that our numbers have been so low for so long, but we literally have been having record days for the past three weeks. And so uh, we are very, very concerned about that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the comments that I made previously, uh, we oftentimes forget 
about uh, counting those who are uh, differently abled or people who are living with disabilities. And so we must do everything we can to get to the other side of the digital divide, as well as those who are living with disabilities as well, to be sure that we reach what is historically been called the undercounted or hard to count. I simply call them the historically undercounted. So we are doing everything we can to work with various organizations at the community level uh, uh, in terms of our community groups to ensure that we get the word out that everyone must count. Thank you. Absolutely. So um, I'll finish it up by asking a question and then we can go back through if, uh, if anyone has any more questions here. Um, so I guess this will be to both of our speakers uh, this evening. You know, I know the Arizona and the California model, uh, it seems like they were successful and, you know, kind of a similar model to what we have um, uh, to here uh, in the state of Wisconsin. What would be some advice for us um, in sort of presenting this information to the legislator? Uh, and what things have been successful uh, that you all know about uh, in those states uh, that was able to, um, you know, kind of stir up some, you know, acceptance uh, in that respect? So do you want to start or should I start? <laughs> I was going to say, I'll, I'll let the statistician go first. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the one thing to know um, that is different here is that it's my understanding that this commission doesn't have to be listened to by the legislature. In, in Arizona and in California, they, they, ha they have to listen. Like the commission in California, that's, that's it. What they say goes. Um, it, it, interestingly, in Iowa, they have a commission which is demographers um, who, who don't have a legal say in it, right? They put together a, a plan and they send it to the legislature. They just have a, a history and a cult, political culture in Iowa where they won't ever not do <laughs> what the demographers say, right? So they put together a plan and they have an up or down vote and they always vote up. They say, yep, you are the experts, we're gonna do this. So I obviously think it would be wonderful if Wisconsin could have that culture where you all come together and you do this amazing process of bringing everyone together and trying to do, you know, produce the fairest plans and hopefully the legislature will have an up or down vote and ideally an up vote, right? They'll say, we like what you've done. Um, in terms of what you should present to them, I wanted to um, echo again what Ms. Nelson said about um, keeping uh, as much data public as you can. Um, one state that actually has a pretty great online portal, even though they then Kind of go and gerrymander anyway is Texas. Um, they, they have an online um, place where you can um, look at all of the data, you can upload maps, you can see what maps other people have uploaded. I think having that available, not everybody loves drawing maps, there are you know nerds like me, but, um, but a lot of people like looking at other people's maps, right? You look in, you know where you live, you know where your school is, you know, you know, and so you can you can look and see what you like and what you don't like. I think having that available um, as something that you can then send on to the legislature to say, look, here were all the examples, here are all the things, this is how we made our decisions. And then, and then what I said before about, I would write a report that sets out why you made the decisions that you made. What did you prioritize? What did you care about and why? You know, was it that everybody who came here said they cared about something? Was it that, you know, in Wisconsin, it has always been the case that you keep counties whole rather than cities or wh whatever it is, um, explain what you have done and why you, you have done it. So that then hopefully there's also, you know, um, pressure from people in the community, you know, I um, to, to, to have their legislators actually vote um, vote up a map that is that has been really designed by the people you know if you really do a good job and get out there and get comments from everybody then it really will be a people's map um and, and hopefully the legislature can support that and to that i'd simply add that uh i would also encourage this commission to uh take a look at some of the uh listening uh, circles and listening trips uh, that the governor and lieutenant governor have gone on as well, where they have gathered uh, tons of information that's also available and share that publicly as well. Thank you both, appreciate it. So uh, I guess we can just kind of go uh, around the horn again. Uh, uh, Commissioner Tobias, do you have any additional questions? Uh, no, sir, I have no more questions, thank you. Mr. Anthony? Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a, a two-part question, if that's permissible. And so uh, the question is, and, you, and it's directed to uh, Ms. Greenwood and Ms. Nelson, you can answer the first or second part. Um, but the question is, how can we justify a community approach 
when uh, or if the geography says something different. You've got, you know, contiguousness, you've got equal po population. So how can we justify the community approach? Uh, and then second, can technology get us to a fair nonpartisan district? Can technology alone get us to a fair and nonpartisan district? I've gotten lots of emails from people to say, we don't need that commission because uh, GIS maps and the technology can get us there. So can the technology alone get us there? That's a very good question. I think that it's important for that personal touch for people to have their input because uh, especially coming from a scientific background, having uh, gotten received a, a degree in chemistry and a math, a math minor, I know that um, numbers alone can unfortunately be manipulated. That's, that's what Jerry Rigging does. They take a look at the numbers and they they cut it up accordingly. So, I would I would lean a little bit away from just letting the technology alone uh, provide that so-called fairness because unfortunately uh, numbers can be manipulated. That's my two cents. Thank you. No, I mean, I, I think I agree with you, Ms. Nelson. Um, I just think that the the thing is, that if you put an algorithm into a computer, somebody has to program the algorithm, right? And and if that's not all of all of you programming it in a way that in to incorporates, you know, the millions of people of Wisconsin's views, um, then you're not going to get out what you wanted when you you know put the algorithm in. Um, I do think that there is a place though for um, you know things like simulations. So there are there are people in many places that can show you a range, right? So you say, okay, well, is it even possible to you know ha keep every single town whole? And then they they might say, no, you have to split between this many and this many. You know, is it even possible to you know do various things? You could you could go through and and find out the possibilities. Um, but the the thing in the end is you're going to have to make the tough choices. Um, and this comes back to your your first question, right, about the community approach. Um, at some point, right, it, it, it's well, not impossible, but it's going to be a very strange district if you, you know, go from Racine all the way up to you know, Minneapolis. Um, that that's going to that's going to be a difficult district. Um, so there are some things that are impossible. Um, the, the question is uh, how impossible they are if you're looking at the edges of districts. And I think that, um, at least in my experience of Wisconsin, that you, the the desires of people isn't like let's connect two sides of the state it's like it's usually can we keep you know a city whole or can we split a city apart or if we're going to split it do we split it here or do we split it there um and those are the decisions that you will all have to make based on the, the you know what comes into you and my guess is you're going to get people with different views and you just have to think about okay well if we're balancing this what is the right way in some ways you know you are like the founders here <laughs> you get to decide what is the way we want our democracy to be um which is tough i'm uh but i hope you can do it thank you and I have faith in all of you. That's why I'm here tonight. I really do believe in this process. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McClellan for the third district. Yeah, um, I have a question. I guess this will be a little bit more directed to um, Ms. Greenwood, but I know one of the roles of the commission here is to listen to the people and really look at communities of interest and, and find where those are and how to define them. And we'll be listening to a lot of people and getting a lot of data um, that we're going to have to balance. And um, Ms. Greenwood, you said something about using a dot density um, map to see where the communities are. And that's just like the raw people, the number of people, especially in a large area like um, up north. Is there any tools that you know of that would help us that we could start to investigate and learn about that would help us visualize and, and balance some of all the different types of data and information that is um, gonna be somewhat hard to capture, like a, defining a community of interest and plotting it? Yeah. This is um, uh, <laughs> an important question. So uh, when I talked about the dot density map, that was purely so you can see where there are hubs 
of people. I don't know that that really gets at communities because communities can be socioeconomic, they can be racial, they can be religious, they, they can be sports fans, you know, who goes to which supermarket. Um, and so that stuff, I think you often need granular detail from people, but there are a lot of tools out there for visualizing um, maps. So there are some free tools um, that at Tufts, there's a group called the MGGG, metric geometry and gerrymandering group. Um, and they can set up online a thing so you can go in and you can still, they can generate maps, you can move maps around and you can see the consequences of, across various metrics. So they could put in previous election data, they can put in um, demographic data, they, and then anything that's in the, the American Community Survey, so the census that talks about levels of education, you know, home, uh, median home values, all those sorts of things, you can get those data ac across the state. Um, honestly, I think that the the most of the GIS software, I tend to use Maptitude, and it, it's a little bit like if people have used Photoshop, you have layers, and so you can just click layers on and off. And so sometimes I find myself, well, in this area, you know, I know rivers are important, so I'm going to have the rivers on, and then maybe I'll have the streets behind that. Um, in another place, it, you know, it might be that the town lines are the important thing, so I'll have the town lines on. Um, you will probably all become familiar with being able to click between those things. In fact, I know at the, the California Commission that I mentioned for you, they actually had that up on that they had the map in the mapping software on a big screen when they had their hearings after they produced a draft map. So they could say, so people could say, no, 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 move that over there. And they could literally click and move and see the boundary change and see the effect that would have on, on various you know, statistics for the plan. Um, now, of course, when you say statistics for the plan, I, I do think the Census Bureau has a, has a ton of things. It doesn't have who's a community. <laughs> That's what you need to get from people. Um, but there, there are also, there's a tool, I believe, maybe it's MGGG that's doing it, where they want people to go in and say, what's your community, right? Put a, put a line around it and say what you think it is. So you can have that sort of crowdsourced. Um, I guess the one, actually it's not, that's a group from Princeton that's doing that. Um, the, the worry, of course, with all these things is you would want to make sure that it's not manipulated by people who are trying to, you know, gain advantage. Um, I will just give this kind of crazy example in Florida where they had um, a requirement that you couldn't have um, partisan advantage in the maps. They had a process where they had public submissions and there was a public submission from a student at a university. And then there was subsequent litigation. And during the discovery process, they talked to this student and they said, oh, this is really interesting. The whole map was based on, on what you submitted. And he said, I didn't submit a map. What are you talking about? And so somebody had pretended to be him, I guess, to submit a map, um, you know, which is kind of crazy. But um, hopefully if you have this transparent process where people are, are open and honest and you can, you know, I'm sure there are computer security people that you can get to make sure that you know what is being submitted and where it's coming from, then hopefully you can look at a map with all those different layers and, and get a sense of which are the ones that are important to different people in different places. Thank you. Uh, from the uh, 4th Congressional District, uh, Commissioner Rain Gale, sorry. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Ford. Um, I haven't really formulated this question fully yet, but it would be for Ms. Greenwood. Uh, you had mentioned sort of in passing that Wisconsin has this uh, interesting dynamic where uh, people who are in prison are counted for the district that they are in the district that the prison is located versus the district they may have originally come from. And so in some ways, this this seems to me, at least as as uh, considering, you know, felony voting laws and such, too, that you have people who are uh, have no like they can't have, they don't have a say in 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 their uh in their congressional district or or their or their legislative district and so is there a way that this commission uh through the way we draw maps has any way to address this like lack of um uh what i would see perceive as fairness of uh, uh because of that issue or is that something like separately on the books uh, that the state legislature has to address um, I would want to look into this more as, as a good lawyer. I don't want to answer on the fly. My understanding is that it is something that is a law um, in terms of the, the state requirements, but, but I would want to check that. Um, the, the group to ask is the Prison Policy Initiative. They know this stuff inside out and back to front. They can tell you where every prison is, <laughs> uh, where, where people come from, where they're going to and so on. Um, so if you, you know, if you can make that decision, the, the way that some other states have dealt with what they call you know, prison gerrymandering um, is by 
um, counting the person and, and the census, sorry, releases two sets of data They you can get the census with everybody where they physically are, so in their prison, and you can also get the version that puts the people back in the homes that they came from. Um, and so if you do that, then they would be counted in, in the community where their kids and family and everything, or where they're going back to, you know, when they when they leave prison. Um, so there is a very sort of easy way to do it with data. Um, from a legal perspective, I would wanna check into that. I definitely wanna echo what uh, Ms. Greenwood just said, uh, because I know that that is uh, something that we've been talking about within the complete count uh, census committee um, because of places like Oshkosh, Green Bay and others, Wausau that have these uh, correctional facilities in them, but the population co uh, come from places like uh, uh, further down state, uh, Milwaukee, Madison, Racine, Kenosha, et cetera. And so uh, I'm not an expert on it either, but I do know enough about it to be dangerous to explain <laughs> that uh, there is clearly a way for, for, for a person to make an argument that when they're counted, that the count should go back to where, uh, as Ms. Greenwood has just uh, adequately said, stated, where their families and children and places are. Then there's also the other argument, the counter argument, of course, is, well, they should be counted where they are taking up um, space and lights and consuming food and, and water and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, those are the two things that I would, I would definitely encourage you to learn more about, but I think it's an excellent question. Thank you both. All right, we have about two more minutes here. Um, we'll see, uh, Commissioner Ramp, do you have any questions? Thank you, I have a question for um, Ms. Nelson. I understand that the Secretary of Commerce has decided to halt uh, the census early on October 5th, as you described. Um, do you expect that date to stick and what implications do you see for Wisconsin and for our work? Thank you so much for asking. I'll try to answer this as swiftly as I can with the time remaining. Uh, the original date was October 31st, Halloween, uh, uh, because the uh, internal guideline dates that we've been working under all year since April 1st of the official census day uh, have been sliding all summer due to uh, the priority of uh, our attention as a country on COVID-19. So this decision to roll it back to September 30th uh, was, was something that really we didn't see coming. It just came out of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, of course, with the, uh, with the judge, uh, uh, temporarily uh, causing an injunction uh, legally asking for it to go back to October 31st. Then we finally got, uh, not even officially on the on the U.S. Census website, but through social media, we heard from uh, Wilbur Ross um, announcing that right now the target date is October 5th. So just prior to our meeting tonight, I met with my, my chair, Jerry Iverson, uh, who is the chair of the Complete Count Committee for Outagamie County with me. And right now he said, the best thing I can say tonight is it's a strong maybe that it may be October 5th. But if the uh, if the court ruling uh, holds up, it could be extended back to the original date of October 31st. And we're hoping that that is what happens, of course, to give people all the time possible to count. But uh, it's a big strong maybe of October 5th. That's my best answer for you, but thank you for asking it. All right, well, thank you to uh, both of our speakers. Thank you again so much, uh, both to Ruth and to Karen for coming out and uh, speaking with us and we truly appreciate it. And we look forward to kind of keeping lines of communication open in the future, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm so honored to even be a part of this esteemed panel. Guys, we're just going to uh, take a couple minutes here uh, just to um, uh, switch out and uh, we'll get the um, uh, community testimony, uh, public testimony portion of the um, uh, presentation ready.
Hi, Dan, can you hear me? This is Jean. Hello. Hi, thank can you, you all me? for joining. Yep, we, we're just gonna, we're on a short break while we get folks in. And so if everyone can just remain muted at the moment, then we will get back shortly. Jean, if you could mic, uh, mute your microphone. Thank you. Thank you all. We are now going to begin approximately one hour of public testimony. The individuals testifying tonight registered ahead of time to testify for tonight's meeting. As a reminder to tonight's testifiers, this hearing is recorded and is being streamed live. Each individual will have three minutes to testify to the commission. There will be a two minute warning bell to let individuals know what that their time is nearly up. After three minutes, I will note that your three minutes are over and we will move on to the next individual. To ensure the maximum amount of time for the members of the public to address, maximum number of individuals to address the commission members, the commission members will not be answering any questions or providing any comments following individuals' testimony. This is a very similar practice that legislative committees such as the Legislative Committee on Joint Finance follows. Finally, as a reminder, if any members of the public would like to provide feedback or comments to the commission at any point throughout the tenure of the People's Maps Commission Initiative, you are encouraged to submit comments through the public comment form that is available on wisconsin.gov maps. Okay, we're gonna get started and um, I promise I will try not to butcher individuals' names. The first individual is Dan Thano from the 8th Congressional District. Dan? Well, thank you very much. At the age of 25, I became the second youngest person in Wisconsin history to be elected to the Wisconsin State Senate. I was elected four times to the Senate as a Republican in the 25th District of Northwestern Wisconsin. It's not a Democrat issue or a Republican issue. It is a people issue. I've been involved in government and politics for 50 years. For the past three years, I have given talks around the state on the importance of reforming the process of redistricting on behalf of the Fair Elections Project. I could talk about how it is wrong for politicians to be choosing their voters instead of the other way around. I could talk about how it is wrong that most legislative districts are rigged to favor certain outcomes before the people even have a chance to go to the polls. My major concern with gerrymandering is that it is a major contributing factor to the polarization of politics in our state and nation. Gerrymandered Republican districts tend to elect extremely conservative representatives. Gerrymandered Democratic districts tend to elect extremely liberal representatives. When those extremely conservative Republican politicians and those extremely liberal Democratic politicians are forced together in Madison or Washington, 
they have absolutely nothing in common. That is when consensus building and political compromises breaks down. Without consensus building and political compromises, the very foundations of our democracy are in danger. The polarization of politics is killing our democratic institutions and making us all enemies of one another. Gerrymandering must end. We need to have districting reform to restore the health of our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, our next individual is Richard Schoenbaum from the 8th Congressional District. Richard? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Richard Schoenbaum. I'm a lifelong resident of Appleton, Wisconsin, and the 8th Congressional District. This included living from 2011 until early 2016 in State Assembly District 56. Partisan redistricting in District 56 divided my local community of interest. My representative never lived in Appleton and had no interest in or understanding of its needs. My blue vote never counted as District 56 was drawn to be safely read. And holding a safe seat, my representative was deaf to my pleas on budgets and legislation. The, uh, sorry, I lost my place on the screen. Uh, the previous assembly, the 2011 partisan redistricting redrew District 56 and its sister districts, 55, and 57. District 57 joined Menasha with the southern two-thirds of Appleton, both strongly Democratic. The right-leaning northern third of Appleton was grafted onto District 56, while three of District 56's rural townships and parts of two others were combined with the city of Nina, uh, District 55, making that very Republican. Previously, Assembly District 57 represented nearly all of Appleton, excluding only a small portion in Winnebago County. District 56 contained all the rural townships. And District 55 represented Nina and Menasha, plus that little part of Appleton. Appleton now has two representatives. Nina and Menasha also have different representatives despite being adjacent of similar size and in the same county. The rural districts are now divided between two representatives who also represent significant urban populations. District 56 also became uncompetitive. When two Republicans ran in the 2012 primary, the now incumbent won with 3,639 total votes. A mere handful of voters thereby determined the ultimate win winner in November. His margin of victory that November was 16%, and he has won the general election ever since, once running unopposed, and the other times by margins of 19 and 30%. To my knowledge, he has never voted against his caucus positions. In summary, all three assembly districts that I have referenced are broken districts. They are not fair. I suggest that the commission redraw these districts, starting with the three 2011 maps and we can do better. I urge the commission to draw maps based on communities of interest as compact as possible without regard to the residents of the incumbents and which make districts as competitive as possible. Let your process be totally transparent and continue to- Thank you, Richard. Your three minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you. The next individual is Annalise Wagoner from the 8th Congressional District. Annalise? Good evening. Um, I want to talk about some of the effects of uh, partisan gerrymandering. My name is Annalisa Wagoner. I live at 121 Green Avenue in Alloway, a suburb of Green Bay, but part of the Green Bay public school system. 
A number of years ago, I was fortunate enough to be elected to the Green Bay School Board. I discovered that running for office was a whole new and exciting experience. I enjoyed meeting people and hearing their concerns about our schools. Being an, ele elected, rep uh, being an elected representative was a trust that my fellow citizens had put in me. So as a former local official, I was appalled recently when 47 assembly Republicans sent a letter to school districts statewide telling them to reopen in the midst of a pandemic. This is not the mandate of the legislature. Our schools come under the purview of the state superintendent of public instruction, something done purposely by our forefathers to keep politics out of the schools. Quite a few schools around here did reopen only to close again this week because of COVID. I see this overreach on the part of legislature on the part of legislators who can count on re-election as a result of gerrymandering. They, they did this without debate as so much is done in the legislature these days because the majority party not having to worry about re-election can go ahead and do pretty much what their leadership dictates. Another example got my attention recently. Although make, make no mistake, there have been other instances of overreach. This case involved a small town or county that voted to ban plastic bags. The legislature stepped right in and said, no, they could not ban plastic bags. This position came not from local people, but from ALEC, the conservative think tank that pressures state legislatures. As someone who herself has been elected to public office, I also thought how demoralizing for these local officials who put in their time and energy into caring about their community with little or no compensation when any time this gerrymandered legislature can reach in and say, do this or don't do that. No discussion, no debate, just a command from on high. This does not take into account the many bills that are never even debated in committee, never see the light of day. Giving one party so much power kills debate and kills people's motivation to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Annalise. Our next speaker is Linda Van Beek from the 8th Congressional District. Was Linda able to join us today? Linda, you might be muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, there you are. Sorry. Go ahead and get started. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. The audience that is hearing my testimony tonight still holds hope that speaking out against gerrymandering is what a responsible citizen of a democracy must do. They believe that every person's vote should count. They know it is the core value of a democracy. But as a citizen of this great state of Wisconsin, I feel angry and lost. I know that the values I hold dear are shared by a majority of my fellow citizens, but our voices now go unheard. We have been disenfranchised by the very people who are supposed to care and represent us. When I reach out to my elected officials, I either get no reply or I receive a patronizing form letter that glosses over my concern or doesn't address it at all. As a mother and a grandmother, I'm deeply concerned about my family's health and how legislation affects us from lack of gun control to refusal to acknowledge the climate crisis to the very disturbing approach they have taken regarding COVID-19. I was forced to vote in the election and I went to a public polling place where many people were not even wearing masks. That was a direct threat to my health and that of my family. 85% of people favor sensible gun control legislation, but no matter how many times I ask my representative to vote for that, it is totally ignored because they are more interested in doing what is best for the gun lobby. Lastly, lastly the climate crisis is just that, a crisis, yet the party in power does nothing but vote against climate change legislation. And that is infuriating because I worry so much about my granddaughter's future 
and all young people because they will have to live with what we leave them. How it saddens me to see what the next generation will have to face. I wonder how many children go to bed every night with the same fear my granddaughter expresses. The out of control pandemic has left her anxious about losing a parent and lonely for her friends and classmates. She fears the years ahead and wonders, will there even be a healthy planet left for her to live on? We're supposed to be living in a democracy, which is a representative system of government, but with gerrymandering, this is not the case. It is one party rule, and I don't know how anyone finds that acceptable. I'm a patriotic citizen and a proud Wisconsinite who believes in the American way. Voting is vitally important important to me and without fair district maps, my vote simply doesn't count. My voice is lost. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. The next individual that is registered to testify is Jason Berna from the 8th Congressional District. Jason? Do we have a Jason on the line? Okay, it looks like maybe Jason was unable to join us tonight, but we do hope that he submits a comment through the um, information form. The next individual on the list is Kenneth Turk from the 8th Congressional District. Kenneth? Good evening and thank you. I'm Ken Turk, a lifelong resident of Wisconsin. I grew up in Kenosha, raised my family in Waukesha, moved to Shorewood and, and retired up in the town of Sevastopol in Door County, where I now reside. I recall I have not been super active in politics other than trying to vote at absolutely every opportunity. Uh, but I recall when the city of Milwaukee, and it was my primary concern when I signed up to speak tonight, when Milwaukee was divided, their neighborhoods and communities torn apart because of the expressway systems barreling through existing neighborhoods, but they not only interrupted the community life, but for people who relied on public transportation made it extremely difficult to vote. Now, now that Wisconsin allows absentee ballots without an excuse, all you have to do is request it, uh, that's less of a problem, the, the actual physical voting. Um, but however, there's still a need, as we've seen so much recently, that the instructions and the locations of bringing ballots, especially with the current post office concerns. So it's just another thing for you to consider while you're making your maps. And that is, as was mentioned by one of your speakers tonight, rivers and lakes and highways do in fact divide and or unite different communities and it, it adds one more complexity which I'm sure is a difficult thing to take into account. The other point made tonight though was transparency so all of us citizens can have a lot of confidence in what comes out of your committee and I've, I've often been surprised the basic whenever there's a meeting who what why, when, where. Uh, I happened to read uh, an article in the paper where I was able to go to your website to sign up to speak tonight. But on that website, there was one important thing missing, where. I assumed I would get an email and I did today to uh, sign up through this Zoom session. But the other part was the when. Unless I read something wrong, the website said 5.30, but when the email came the night, it said five o'clock, was the beginning of your major meeting if we wanted to participate and learn. And it was certainly a wonderful experts that you had. Um, however, where, even though it was on our local radio station today, there was mentioned in the newspaper, nowhere was it clear how to participate in your streaming event. So I would just recommend you to make sure your media people include all. Thank you, Kenneth. Who, why, when, where, 
when they're raising and providing transparency to what you're doing. And thank you all for your efforts. Perfect, thank you so much, Kenneth. The next individual who has signed up is Christine Seidel from the 8th Congressional District. Thank you to the People's Maps Commission for inviting Wisconsin citizens to be heard tonight. In the last year, I have taken my role as a U.S. citizen to new levels, becoming a poll worker and a U.S. Census field enumerator. This issue of fair maps is important for both roles, which I've taken on during an unprecedented time of health and economic crisis and civil unrest. But I ask myself, whose job is it to participate fully in democracy? And if not me, then who? And now is one more chance to participate in democracy by speaking out for fair maps in Wisconsin. The job of government and those chosen to serve the people of this democratic country is to protect, defend, and enhance their lives. Was the governor doing his job when he executed the Safer at Home order on March 12, 2020, due to the emergent COVID-19 health crisis? Was the lawsuit filed against the Evers Safe at Home order putting my health at risk? Yes. Those responsible must be held accountable for attempting to reopen businesses before we had adequate testing and access to personal protective equipment, including holding the April primary election during the COVID crisis. As a poll worker for the April primary, I contacted Governor Ebers and Lieutenant Governor Mandela and Representative Big Stefan and Senator Robert Coles about my concern for the dangerous situation presented by holding in-person voting without adequate preparation and strict guidelines for safe distancing, sanitizing, and personal protective equipment for poll workers and voters. Governor Evers and Lieutenant Governor Mandela responded with an email to me, and I know they had a tough decision facing them to postpone the election without, with the lawsuit challenging the safe at home order. I didn't hear from Robert Coles nor Dave Steffen regarding my support of Evers' executive order to postpone elections till June well within his power as governor to protect the safety and health of poll workers and voters alike. The decision I made wasn't easy, but I needed to protect my own health at age 67 and not risk being irresponsible to myself, my family and my community. So I refused to work at the polls for fear of spreading or contracting the infection. The lawsuit upheld by the Wisconsin Supreme Court forced thousands of Wisconsin voters to turn out at the understaffed reduce polling locations across the state. Green Bay only had two polling locations open, resulting in long lines and leaving many people wondering where to go to vote. Is that what democracy looks like? It's a sad situation when the Wisconsin state government must draw lines around political battlegrounds at the cost of people's lives and livelihoods. I expect better. I expect government to act in accordance with the laws and use all its powers to protect the people of the state they serve, our businesses, our farms, our communities where we live, work, and attend school. Sadly, this form of representation drawn by the Wisconsin legislature is not fair because it does not serve all the people's diverse needs, does not support the sense of community, and does not promote working together for and with the people of this great state of Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. The next individual registered is Penny Bernard Schaber from the 8th Congressional District. Penny? Thank you very much. I wasn't able to change the name on my screen, so I have an alias here. It's um, a good alias. Yeah. I, whoops. I am Penny Bernard Schaber, and I live in Appleton in Assembly District number 57, which was mentioned by both Mr. Shaneboom and by your speaker, uh, Ms. Greenwood. This 57th Assembly District in 2011 was packed with voters that lean Democratic. Two other districts, the 55th and the 56th, were given a much more Republican-leaning parts of Appleton. I was the state representative for the 57th Assembly District from January 2009 until January of 2015. So I was directly impacted by the gerrymandering. In 2008, the 57th included most of the city of Appleton. It was compact and contiguous, making it easier for local elected officials to communicate with the state legislature because there was mainly one state legislator that they had to contact. The 57th of 2008 and 2010 was a very competitive district 
It had been represented by a Republican for many years, but was flipped in 2008 and maintained by me in 2010 as a Democrat. The 57th of 2012 was a very different district. It was changed dramatically. It took in an extra county beyond Outagamie County, and it was um, packed to be a Democratic district. So I had an open election that year. I did not even have an opponent on my election. Then when I was not able to run for office any longer in 2014, it was easily won by another Democrat. And then again, uncontested in 2016. That's not how it should be. The legislative, legislative district should be contested. People should have a voice and should have a choice. Elections should give the voters the opportunity to choose their representatives, not the other way around. And I'm sure you'll hear about that a lot during your commission hearings. But there is a very specific standard that I would like you to include in your final determination of the standards and regulations for a nonpartisan redistricting process. I would ask the commission to include the following standard. Past election results cannot be used to determine the boundaries of a district, okay? So the past election results should not be used at all in the determination of the boundaries of the district because the past election should not influence so much the future election results. And Wisconsin should really consider the Iowa model which uses this standard and which holds this standard very closely and does not allow for those previous election results to really impact the future. So I would like to see this, the commission use the, the Iowa model as their model and um, try to look at how they do things. And I know you can adjust it a little bit to make sure that the body in Wisconsin has a say and the final say on the approval of the districts. They don't have to draw them, Thanks, but they have Penny. to approve them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Have a good evening. The next individual registered to testify is Margaret Vaughn of the 6th Congressional District. Margaret, was she able to join us this evening? Looks like Margaret was unable to join us. The next individual is Sally Long of the 2nd Congressional District. Unfortunately, she was unable to join us as well. The next individual is Brady Faust from the 3rd Congressional District. Brady? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Unmute. Hello, my name is Brady Faust. The Constitution requires that a census be taken every 10 years, thus establishing the Bureau of the Census to form the basis for congressional reapportionment. After the first census of 1790, reapportionment has proceeded the same way every 10 years with human beings drawing maps. The process has always been partisan with parties in power drawing the map to favor their reelection. When a party cannot win on ideas, they cheat by partisan redistricting. The only way to eliminate this cheating is to completely remove humans from the process by relying on computer algorithms to draw maps. The plan should have the following rules. First, the building blocks. Districts must be aggregated census blocks. Census blocks are the smallest geographic areas for which the census collects population data, population on pers uh, data on persons. Secondly, the resulting aggregation should be as balanced as possible. That is, each district should contain the same number of people. Thirdly, the, re the resulting districts must be as spatially compact as possible. Population ba uh, balance and spatial compactness can be measured mathematically so that one plan can be compared to another to determine which is better. There's no way to quantify a community and no way to say how communities should be weighted, nor is it required by the Constitution. The optimum outcome would require thousands of permutations, perhaps hundreds of thousands. Each permutation must be tested in terms of balance and compactness. This, is only, this can only be done officially by machines. The best way to do this is not with another commission. We've been doing this for every census since 17. 90, but by recommending an automated solution. This removes partisanship completely and adjusts for changes in population dis a distribution with this each census. So how do we get the best map by such algorithms? The process should be turned over to private companies 
to compete for a set amount, say $5 million. The last redistricting process costs much more. Every company would run thousands of simulations to get their lowest solution. Each company would submit the final map, the balance and spatial compactness measures, and the source code of the algorithm. The best, the map of the best score would get the money. Race is included in census blocks, and given residential segregation in Wisconsin, it's highly likely that some districts would be majority minority ones, especially in Milwaukee. Avoiding the use of race in the algorithm would eliminate court challenges to the district because race was not the predominant factor in creating the district. Finally, it's disconcerting that a commission charged with making a map does not contain a professional geographer or an experienced geographic information system professional. Reapportionment is too important to be left to committees. Turn it over to nonpartisan machines. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. The last individual we have registered to testify is Jean Radke from the 5th Congressional District. Jean? Hi there. Uh, I am an independent from Wauwatosa, and I wanted to give you just kind of a historical perspective, my view of the problem and the solution, and also let you know that 72% of Wisconsinites want to ban gerrymandering. So from a historical perspective, <clears throat> in 2011, the GOP in Wisconsin swept to power, taking over control of the Assembly, the Senate, and the governor's office. And it took the practice of partisan map rigging to new levels. The problem was that it redrew the maps, not in public, but in the Wisconsin, in the Wisconsin Capitol, but instead in a locked office of a private law firm, Michael Best and Friedrich. The media was not allowed in, the public was not allowed in, Democrats weren't allowed in, and even Republican legislators were not, who were not in leadership had to ask to be let into the locked room. And once they got to see their own redrawn districts, they had to sign an oath of secrecy. The Republican leadership hired demographic specialists and computer experts to employ the latest mapping technology to create maps that were more rigged than almost any in modern history. The leadership then ran through the maps through the legislature in 10 days. The bill, 2011 Act 43, was signed into law by Governor Scott Walker. And the new maps did what they were designed to do. They ensured that Republicans grabbed more seats. For instance, in the first election under the plan, Republicans won 60 out of 99 seats in the assembly, despite losing the aggregate statewide vote. In 2018, the Republican Party was so gerrymandered in Wisconsin that the legislature was won by Democrats by 190,000 votes in the state assembly, pretty much a landslide. Yet the Republicans held the legislative seats 64 to 35. The solution is the Iowa solution. It's easy, it's reliable, a reliable way to achieve fair voting maps. For the last 35 years, career civil servants and not the leaders of the party in power have drawn the district maps there, the specific criteria that guard against partisanship and favoritism. Senator Dave Hansen of Green Bay and Representative Robin Vining of Wauwatosa have introduced and um, introduce companion bills to adopt the Iowa model for Wisconsin. And I want to remind you, Wisconsin's, Wisconsinites, 72% of us want to ban gerrymandering. And I just want to reiterate that during the pandemic, uh, we wanted to allow enough time for mail-in only elections to be conducted. Voss and Fitzgerald refused to postpone the election or discuss any alternatives. So I, uh, I just want to, again, share my opinion. Please give us um, fair maps. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Have a good evening. That concludes um, the public testimony for this evening's hearing. Chair Ford, I will now pass it back to you to close out the hearing and adjourn. Thank you, Molly. Um, I just want to thank all of our uh, commissioners for coming out today, all our speakers as well. Uh, as well as you, uh, the public, for providing that testimony and for everyone who watched at home. Uh, hopefully, this initial meeting has uh, given you a taste of kind of the transparency that we're going for, uh, as well as uh, our goals uh, and what we are considering. 
Uh, we'll continue to uh, press along with this uh, creation of this map and try to remain transparent and try to um, uh, do what's best uh, for the state and listen to you and do what's best for, um, uh, for you as well. Um, as a reminder, uh, the commission will hold another virtual public uh, hearing uh, to get to Mr. Turk's uh, point uh, with the who, what, why, and where. Uh, so it'll be us. Uh, it'll be an online public hearing uh, on October 29th. Uh, and the 5th Congressional District will be streaming from. Uh, registration to testify uh, for the October 29th hearing will open soon on our website. Uh, however, you can submit uh, comments to the commission uh, at any point in time. Uh, we look at all the public input. Uh, that website will be wisconsin.gov front slash people's maps. Again, it's wisconsin.gov front slash people's maps. Uh, unless uh, there are any other comments, uh, this evening's hearing is now adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.